and we're going to get started. So good evening, uh, welcome to this evening's careers webinar. My name is Mark Cameron, I'm a Chief Petty Officer up at Sea Cadets Aberdeen, hence the really thick Scottish accent, so I apologise for those who might need a translator for my, my dodgy accent. The plan of attack for tonight, guys, is we're going to go through um, go through some careers uh, presentations with Becky Watford, who will introduce herself in, in just a second. How, how it's going to work is there's going to be a, a presentation for everybody to go through. If you've got any questions at all, uh, you can see there's the Q&A function in the bottom bar. Uh, you type your question in there. We'll get to the questions, uh, some maybe throughout, but at the end there will be a 15-20 minute se session for some questions and answers from our panellists. So as well as me and as well as Becky, we've also got Ruth Werner on as well, who's going to act as our second adult. So without further ado, I'll just hand you across to Becky. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, hopefully everybody can hear me. If, if I can have a thumbs up, that would be a good place to start. Mark, hear me? Am I on mute? Oh, excellent. Right. OK, so uh, thank you all for dialing in. And uh, no doubt it's um, fairly wet and windy where you are. It's certainly wet and windy down here in Portsmouth and Gosport. Some of you might be familiar with Gosport as it's the head of the... Um, Sea Cadets Offshore Unit, so uh, that's where their HQ is. So a little bit about me. Uh-oh, we've got technology fail. Right, this is me. Um, I uh, volunteer on um, TS Royalist, a sailing master or a watch officer. And prior to working here at QHM, I spent 12 years uh, next door at the Joint Service Sailing Centre, sailing with armed forces all over the world and uh, sail training has been me for some time, but I took a sideways step to uh, the Queen's Harbour Master in Portsmouth. So I'm here to talk to you a little bit about port operations and what we do, and um, we'll do questions at the end because otherwise I think it'll get quite complicated. So here we go. So Queen's Harbour Master is politely known as QHM or Q. Um, the post goes back quite a long way and um, we're set about by the the Regulations Act for dockyards in 1865 and the uh, Secretary of State appoints said um, person and in the UK we've got QHM Portsmouth so there's a Queen's Harbour Master Portsmouth we've got a Queen's Harbour Master for Plymouth stroke Devonport depending on how you call it and there's one for Faz Lane and then there's also uh, a QHM in Gibraltar and in Cyprus and in Falkland Islands, because obviously these are all sort of crown ports. So, so why why would we have a QHM? Well, the, the, the QHM is and his team, which I'm a part of, is there to uh, effectively provide a, ha a safe haven for Her Majesty's warships, because as I'm sure you are aware, Her Majesty's warships protect um, the nation and defence of the realm and our freedom at the end of the day. So. Um, we're, we have an act, which we appoint the Queen's Harbour Master, but if we didn't update a bit more occasionally with a, a port order, that act would be irrelevant because it would all be based on old fashioned vessels without engines and square sails like Royalist. And um, we'd, we'd be a bit stuck behind the curve, which wouldn't make things very safe. So we have a, a dockyard port order and we look at that about every 10 to 15 years and tweak it and bring it more modern so the last one brought jet skis into it the next one will bring hoverboards into it as, as just two examples but uh, to change it isn't a five minute job so we have to go out to consultation but that's an, another story so then we have to comply to something called the port marine safety code which is uh, run by department of transport and the maritime coast guard agency and this basically dictates what we need to have to make it safe so the Queen's Harbour Masters ports are all effectively run by the Navy. So I work for uh, the Queen, as in the Crown or a civil servant. And then I work for the Ministry of Defence. And then I work for the Royal Navy as part of the Ministry of Defence. So for argument's sake, our neighbours, who are, are Southampton port, um, they still have to comply to the Port Marine Safety Code. 
but they obviously don't have the Dockyard Port Regulation Act, and they still have to comply to this because then it keeps everybody safe. How do we do that? Well, that's what we're here to talk about tonight. So we do have a, a lot of information, should you feel the need to explore it and find out a little bit more about port operations on our website, which I'll give you at the end, and our safety and environmental management system is there as well, which basically tells you how we work and what we should do to keep everybody safe. Moving on. So this is our area. When people think Portsmouth, they just think this little bit in here, just north of in there. So they just think of that. Whereas actually, we've got all this lot. So this is 55 square miles. We're one of the biggest harbour authorities in the UK. We've got a bit of a funny shape. And people say, oh, that's a bit strange. So we think going back to 1865, Queen Victoria had a holiday home here. So they made a boundary from cows at Old Castle Point across to Hillhead and our neighbours to the west of Southampton. And then they came out of Portsmouth Harbour, went straight across Langston Harbour with a shooting range, which is why that goes over there. And it comes down at a Jordan Sea angle and then and crossing to Sandown Bay. We don't know why it does that. It's been like it for 150 years, so we're not too worried. In the future, we'll probably look at reducing that a bit because it's quite a drain because in here we have a whole lot of infrastructure to make it safe. So whether it's um, buoys, which we'll come back to, or an ace of navigation, or charts and everything else. But you might have been in the Solent and you might have well have seen what goes on out here, but 40% of the UK's leisure activity happens in our patch. So if you think that's, that's why it looks busy on a summer's day, if you've been out in the Solent, then you'll understand why. So. We have a lot going on there and combined with all that leisure activity, we have a huge amount of commercial traffic. So the, the container boats, the cruise ships, the oil tankers, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, which come in around the NAB channel here, up the deep water and then they come into um, the Solent here through the forts, past the ride middle, round the bend and then up into Southampton. So. We actually have an agreement with our neighbours in Southampton that instead of making it over complicated, we let them manage the traffic that's going straight into Southampton, which I'll come on to a bit more in a bit. But we handle the traffic that's going into Portsmouth, but they handle the, the traffic that's going in there. How much traffic is there? Mm. Inside the harbour, just inside this bit here, there's about 120,000 moves a year, which I'll, which I'll come back to a bit more detail, but that's including ferries and warships and everything else. That's just our bit. That isn't a bit that's going into Southampton. And if we add all the, the, the Jack Petchies, the John Wirt Jerwoods, the, the TS Royalists, the City Liverman, et cetera, et cetera, it gets quite busy. So moving on. So that, that dockyard port of Portsmouth and the Queen's Harbour Master, we talked about being a safe haven for all the Queen's vessels. So here's a little snapshot. Perhaps some of you are thinking about joining the Navy. Um, but here we've got a, a little sample of what's what's home for us. Or sorry, what's home for these vessels. So we've got two of these Queen Elizabeth aircraft carriers, which we'll come on to in a bit more detail. But 14 of these P2000s that are, are dotted around the country. And if you're thinking about going to university and joining a Naval, a naval, um, naval unit there, University Royal Naval Unit, I think they are, Ernus. They quite often are seen to be um, in charge of P2000s and they do all sort of navigators and training and it's a, it's a good grounding. We've got these Type 23s, which are the real workhorse of the Navy. You might have seen um, on Channel 5, I think it was the last couple of weeks, there was um, a programme called Warship. I think it was on HMS Northumberland. She's actually a plymouth brace frigate, but uh, we have... Um, five of her sisters that call Portsmouth their home. Then we've got the uh, mine counter measure vessels, which are the, the big plastic ones. Funny old thing, they're plastic, because when they look for the mines, they don't want to be blown up. Um, they're, they're quite small. They have a quite small crew, I think about 40. Um, we've got, I think we've got six or seven of those. And then we've got these uh, Type 45s. Again, they had a program about them. HMS Dragon and those of you that have seen the the Bond, the latest Bond movie might have seen HMS Dragon in that who uh, fires a, something to save the world at the end of it. And then underneath we've got um, the river boats. Now some people call them river boats, some people call them off offshore patrol vessels, but these are these are fairly new. There's there's about a dozen. There's six dotted around the world. There's um, one in the Falklands permanently to keep an eye on what's going down there and into the um, into Antarctica. There's, I think, one somewhere near Tonga at the moment. There's one in the Caribbean. 
Uh, there's some in the channel doing stuff in the channel, but they're they're quite small, they're quite nippy, and they've got a really really good long range, so they they can go a long way, which is uh, obviously very helpful. And then in the middle here, we've got some divers. We've also got the um, one of the Royal Navy diving units in our in our home as well. Moving on from that, to make all that happen, we need all these support vessels. So we'll come into a bit more detail about those, but. When a ship comes in, it's not like a small vessel that just comes in under its own power. It needs to be connected to um, tugs and what have you so that it can be manhandled onto the dock safely. Um, and to help us do that, obviously you can see we've got little tugs, big tugs. We've got um, police vessels because obviously um, in today's world of threats and um, cyber attacks, we're slightly nervous as anybody would be for the uh, security of our country and the police always uh, escort the, the larger oil vessels and um, warships in and out. And then the Marines have got a couple of these sort of um, support vessels, which they can put um, fancy things like that, um, very fast vessel on the back or containers. So when they go off to Norway, they can go and, go and um, uh, <laughs> jump in and out of very cold ponds with lots of gear on, but uh, each to their own. More police launches, and then this is a, a sullage barge. So, in a modern port, you might um, uh, berth a vessel and then plug in to um, a sewage waste system, which whisks it off to the mainland UK. But because our port was established in Henry VIII's time, some of you might be aware of the Mary Rose and the sad tragic accident, all our infrastructure is very dated and very old. So it's it's beautiful, and perhaps if you're ever at a loose end, take yourself down to the the historic Darden, dockyard in Portsmouth, there's another one in Chatham, and I think there's another one up in Hartley Pool or somewhere. Um, and it's a very good day out learning about what people used to do. Then we've got some pilot vessels and we've got some passenger boats. So we've got quite a lot going on, but most of these are contractors. So all the tugs and the passenger vessels and the pilot vessels are all contractors. They, um, they, uh, they work primarily for us and occasionally they might work for somebody else but they have a contract with us and all the staff that are associated with it. A lot of them are ex-military because they understand what's going on which is nice. Then Portsmouth has all this lot coming in and out as well so we've got ferries, you might have been with your family on a, a holiday to France and you've got one on the international port, you might like your bananas, bananas come in on um, vessels in, into Portsmouth International Port. I think half the UK's bananas come in there. You might have caught a ferry to the Isle of Wight. There's um, the Victoria Wight, which is one of these hybrid electrics, very green ferries. You've got the, the uh, hovercraft, that's worth a day. That's the only hovercraft working on a, a passenger route left. We've got the fast cap. I think that's cancelled tonight, along with the hovercraft, because it's a bit bumpy. We've got the Gosport Ferry. If you've joined uh, one of the vessels at um, Fort Blockhouse, you might have come down on the train and then um, <laughs> caught the green ferry across the harbour. We've got some pilot launches, which I'll come on to more. And then Portsmouth now, the uh, international port, has started taking the medium-sized cruise ships because they're too, too small for Southampton, but they're about the right size for Portsmouth. And then you've got sort of vessels like this, which are multi-role, they're multi-cat, so they might pick up big, big fenders for people to move them around or they might pick up moorings or they might lift a sunken boat they've got they've got lots of badges but the commercial vessels all go to here so this is the international port so some of you might be on HMS Bristol there which is on the bottom of Whale Island this is the motorway coming into Portsmouth coming into the dockyard here so that's the top of the dockyard there and the international port is actually run by the council um, they work very closely with us. Uh, they have their own set of um, pilots and tugs and what have you, but uh, they're, they're pretty busy. They, they like, they're going to see a lot of cruise ships and a lot of ferries, and you can see there's uh, three or four in, in, uh, in the dock on that particular picture. Right, I'm just going to have a, a little video for you here while I catch a drink, so we'll play this. So this is uh, HMS Dragon in the dry dock. Um, and I don't necessarily know if it's her coming out, but um, we'll run it twice. So have a look at it and then I'll talk over the top. Oops. Oh, no. Oh, no. It's all gone horribly wrong. All right. We forget that. We're not going to do that. Right. Moving on. The QHM Portsmouth family tree. So I mentioned the Port Marine Safety Code and it's got to, or it enables us to decide what we need to work efficiently. Because at the end of the day, we still get 
um, audited by poor operations. So poor operations look at us, they look at our colleagues in Plymouth, they look at our colleagues in uh, Faz Lane, and they even look at our colleagues in Gibraltar to make sure we're legal and we're doing things as safe as we can do. So at the top of our family tree is the QHM, so that is the, the Queen's Harbour Master. The gentleman that's in charge at the moment is called Nick. He was a pilot before he uh, came to be QHM and before that he was in the Navy. So he's, he, most of his working life has been involved with Navy and for shipping. And then the next row down, we've got the Queen Elizabeth Choice Pilot. So that's uh, a gentleman that's his primary role is to make sure the Queen Elizabeth class carriers come in and out. We've got the Maritime Services Superintendent or super he basically keeps an eye on contracts and making Thor Serco who are the people that drive the tugs and the passenger vessels and some of the other uh, dockyard services he keeps them in check we've got a deputy so there's always a deputy or a QHM on just to make sure everything's okay and then we've got a chief admiralty pilot and then the next row across is the waterfront XO so our waterfront XO is really what happens shoreside? So XO as in um, executive officer, just like you'd have on a ship. And he's sort of responsible for um, ships facilities, visits, uh, rounds in the dockyard to make sure everything's nice and tidy. He gets very twitchy if morning colours aren't observed to the correct standard. Um, and he's an all round good guy, ex-Navy with lots and lots of experience, but he's a, he's a good guy. But He's sort of sideways to our department, but he's still in our department. So second row down, we've got the Port Conservancy officer. Um, he's sort of surveying and hydrography, which we'll come on to a bit more. Port safety officer, which is a lot of legislation. He keeps his eye on things like oil spill plans, um, risk assessment reviews. Um, what else does he do? He does uh, lots of training to do with safety and we often get um, little um, st standstill for safety days and we sort of have to think about things that we wouldn't normally think about. Um, and he, he coordinates when we have a port audit. So he's, he's quite a busy guy. He's also um, a Royal Naval uh, Reserve. I think he's been mobilised in a couple of months time and he also got mobilised in, um, in the middle of the pandemic as well. Then under the under him or with him, that's not quite right, is me. So I've got this really silly name of Port Safety Boat Patrol or the Port Safety Officer Assistant. And my role is um, really keeping an eye on the leisure stuff and backing up the Port Safety team. So I'm involved in investigations as well, which Port Safety Officer obviously does, and a certain amount of um, legislation and enforcement. And in the summer, when the weather's nice, because I don't go out when it's raining, I have a rib, which we'll talk about at the end. And some of my, you might have seen me in it with uh, Queen's Harbour Master Dan side. And we engage with uh, various members of the boating community from jet skis to uh, sailors, to beachgoers, to windsurfers, to uh, yachtsmen and motorboatmen, just to make sure they're safe. And if they're not safe, then they will get some uh, guidance from me. The other half of the department is, is the pilots. Now, if you think about all those warships coming out, coming in and out, they can't just come in, they need a pilot. So the pilot brings them in. Um, there might be one pilot or two pilot or three pilots. When we bring the carrier in, we have three pilots on board. If it's a small vessel like a, a, um, like a patrol vessel, an OPV or something, we'll only have one. And then we've also got the guys in harbour control, which I'll come on to a bit more. So they're sort of slicing into the fact that when the pilot brings a ship in or any vessel over 30 meters we need to ask authority to come in and out a bit like air traffic and then the people that sort of jack all that up are the movements team so the movements team is is a bit like a big car park officer really so he's got various things that you can put in various places so if we look at the next slide this is our office so um i mentioned the fact that the the dockyard was established for Henry VIII. This building here is known as Semaphore Tower, and um, we overlook the off we overlook the water. The main office overlooks the water, whereas I overlook the dockyard, which is good and bad for weather and sunshine um, and getting any work done. Um, we're all in here. We were on the fourth floor, and then our friends Serco, the contractors, are all in here. And then underneath is Navy X, Future of the Navy, and then they've got 
uh, King Alfred, the reserves unit underneath, and then in the bottom, we've got the riggers. So the riggers are the ones that effectively take the lines when the ships come alongside. So um, if you think about it, if you've done um, seamanship when you've been throwing heaving lines, so you, you've, you've tied a heaving line in your unit and you've thrown it across, the, the rigger would be on the end of that and then he'll he'll pull that in and then put the bite over the bollard or, or whatever they're tying up to. And then they also sort the gangways out as well. So they're a, they're a busy team. But this floor here is harbour control. So we'll talk a bit more about that. But they've got the best view in the building. They've got uh, this side and around the corner and it's five floors up. So as you can imagine, you can see you can see quite a long way, especially when it's clear on a day like today. And it's pretty snotty and blowing 40 knots. It's not very nice. So going back to those pilots, we've got we've got 10 pilots. These are Admiralty pilots because they tend to drive Admiralty vessels. This is Tony. Tony does our uh, Queen Elizabeth class carriers. He's the QEC pilot. And on the other side, we've got Rachel with a Type 45 there. Um, they work a really good uh, system. They're all um, pilots now because they've been master mariners and they've got a huge amount of seagoing experience before actually deciding they don't want to go offshore anymore and they want to uh, drive vessels in and out and do the interesting bit by putting them alongside. Um, those pilots that work for the international port on the cruise ships are just plain pilots. They don't work for us, they work for the uh, international port. But uh, these guys have a huge amount of experience. This guy, Tony, I think he, he started in the harbour uh, when he was 16, making tea on tugs. And here he is, I think he's 65 now, he's still working hard and um, he's now on the top of the pile. So we, we have a huge amount of time for Tony and a huge amount of respect, as you can imagine. So how do they get out to the ships? Well, they have a launch. So um, the Serco run the uh, Solent Racer and the Solent Spirit, and they um, also move passengers around with them. So if we need to go to Cows or something or other, they'll take us up there. Um, they will also um, take the riggers around the harbour if they need to move or if they need to be a sort of little a private taxi for dockyard work. So our pilots will get on board there and then they proceed out to the vessel. And depending on how big it is, depends on whether they pick it up right outside the harbour or much closer in. And then these pilot vessels, um, the ones with the orange top, they belong to Southampton. Um, and this is a very smart, shiny new pilot vessel. I think they're getting four of those in due course. The big difference is, is they don't take passengers. So our guys take, can take up to 12 passengers to go for that trip to cows or run people around the riggers around or something else. But these guys just purely do pilots and, and they go out in any weather, just like our boys do. And uh, very, very impressive pieces of kit. As you can imagine, the uh, swell in the channel in the next couple of days with all these storms, it's gonna, these guys are going to be earning their money. So that's... Um, one possibility you might think about doing, driving a pilot launch once you once you feel the need to do a bit more boating. Then we've got all these tugs. So we've got different tugs for doing different things. So this is the uh, little baby tractor tug. She does um, the, the smaller ships in and out of uh, the smaller areas where the big vessels can't go. She does quite a lot of um, alongside tow with the fuel barge and also the sullage barge and moves fenders around. Um, these two here also move fenders around. And you can see them there on the back of the carrier. They've actually got their mast down. I don't know if you can see that. Probably better on that one because if the masts were up, they wouldn't be able to get under the um, under the decks. And then here we've got the Tempest. That's the uh, biggest tug in the harbour, and um, she's always on the bow of the carrier when she comes in. So if it all goes horribly wrong, we've got it under control. And then we've got in Indulgent and Independent, and they're sort of in between. Um, different levels of tonnage, so different type of um, certification required to drive it. A lot of these guys are also ex-master mariners and um, decided they don't want to go offshore or out of the sight of land anymore. So they just drive the tugs locally. Great bunch of guys, fantastic. And a great job to do because nice and warm, nice and cozy inside, nice and safe. Because whenever they've got the line secure on the winch, they all retreat to the, uh, the bridge and dink tea. So this is just a couple of examples here. Um, you can see this is a, this is a river boat or an OPV. Um, being pushed on by one of the smaller tugs that looks like Suzanne. There'll be a pilot up on the bridge there, keep an eye on what's going on. There's a rigger on the dock side there. You can see he's got a, he's got a bow line and, and he must be alongside because he's got a jack flying. And then here we've got a Type 23 
with a with the bountiful, which is um, quite a powerful tug. She creates quite a lot of wash, so if we um, be mindful of that when we're using her, and the captains that drive it, and then this one here is on the side. See spinnaker spinnaker tower in the background there. Um, moving on to the the QEC, this is obviously the one that creates all the tension because she's she's the uh, she's been subject to a TV program as well. She's um, the UK's biggest warship. She she needs six tugs when she comes in. You've got an idea. There's a couple down the sides here. That light blue one is a contracted one because we had a poorly tugged for a while, so we had to contract us had to go to somebody else and get one in. She's oh excuse me. She's got uh, a police launch there because as I alluded to earlier, obviously we're worried about security. So when the carrier comes in, we have to shut the harbour because uh, she is obviously quite large, being 280 metres long. She needs 11 metres to float and her volume is 65,000 tonnes. She's 73 metres wide on, on the deck, but her bridge is 28 metres off the centre line. So everything is calibrated for the bridge being, being off the centre line, which is a bit strange, I'm told, when you're driving it, but you get used to it. But when she comes in that harbour entrance, she's actually only got six metres of leeway or error either side. The, the harbour entrance is 200 metres wide, but when she drives up the middle, there isn't much room. And if, you, if you're not in on target there, it's going to be a whole world of pain further up. But uh, because she's so big and she's very manoeuvrable with six tugs on, but if there was a, a lot of wind, like we wouldn't bring her on a day like today because it's just be too windy. Um, so we don't tend to bring her in if it's blowing more than 20 knots because it's just, just a complete nightmare from what I understand. So there's a little bit of a tug activity for you there. I think this vessel was flying, it's um, just been recommissioned or was paying off penance. So they have a fire monitor there, which also enables us to keep safe. So if we have a fire in the port, then we can send a tug out and they can provide a huge amount of um, water through systems very quickly. And then on the on the left here, you can see uh, Prince of Wales or Queen Elizabeth coming in. You can see the, the tug there, tug there, tug there, tug there. Police launch, police launch. Um, she's going up to this jetty here, the other bigger sister's there. And then we've got the u half up the top there. But that's, it looks like it's in the middle of winter, but there's just no traffic because we're just trying to keep it safe. So we talked about movements and the fact there's 120,000 movements a year. Well, that half of that is probably recreational vessels under 20 metres. And then um, you could say what's a move. So a move is a, a sort of programmed evolution. So when the Queen Elizabeth comes in, that would be a move. Um, this is the shipping forecast movement tomorrow for tomorrow. So for Wednesday, so at 5.45 in the morning, the, um, the Commodore Clipper will come in and she'll come from OSB. So that's Outer Spit Boy, which is the start of the, the Portsmouth Approach Channel. You come inside the forts and that's the start of the channel. And then there's another one, um, uh, Ferry Barfleur from Outer Spit Boy going to the PIP again, the international port. Then she's going back out. They don't hang around long with those. And then we've got Open Lock, so if you look on the left hand side here, we've got some locks. So um, they're going to open one of these and we've got a jack up barge, which is a, a funny little thing, which is sort of uh, it has a square with four legs on it and you can put the barge down, float a vessel across onto it and then push it up uh, so that if the vessel needs to go to another yard to have some more work on it but can't go under its own steam and can't be towed that's that's an alternative so you can see here the tugs names so um, what have we got Suzanne, Christina and Indulgent and Gideon Sherwood is going to be the uh, pilot that takes her in and then we've got another another vessel leaving and then we've got they're going to close the lock and there's a whole load more after that but I could only have so much on my screen so if we look on this side, um, this is a, a scale map of, uh, or part of it's the scale of the dockyard here. So that picture of us in the Georgian building is here on Watering Island. And this is South Railway Jetty, then we've got Victory Jetty, then we've got Princess Royal Jetty, and then we've got various walls right up to Fountain Lake. So you could just say, can everything go anywhere? But it can't because that crumbling infrastructure for example, means that we can't put anything big on South Railway Jetty. So you'll, you'll see a Type 23 on there and you'll see a, an OPV, but you won't see a Queen Elizabeth class carrier, strangely enough. You'll always see the Queen Elizabeth class carriers here because they've got 
what are known as fender spacer units in the wall. So it's it's like a little mini pontoon and they go up and down with the tide because otherwise when the tide would go out, the aircraft carrier would overhang, which obviously wouldn't be good as the tide goes out and it'll get stuck on the wall. And then we've got uh, one basin here, which isn't used anymore where HMS Victory is. You've got two basin, which is where the P2000s and the mine counter at Vesa, at the mine hunters live. And then all the tugs live in this corner. And then we've got various places we can dock down type 45s and type 23s. And then there's a few things here which are waiting for disposal. Type 45s normally go on there, type 23s go on here. And then in the corner here is where the pilot launch lives and uh, some of the other smaller vessels. So we talked briefly about, or I talked briefly about harbour control and how pivotal they are. So these are the ones that are saying yay or nay. Can I come in? Can I not come in? So um, there's, there's always three people on watch in this team. There's a supervisor in the chair and then who answers the telephone. And then if you were to be listening, you might have come in on Royalist or John Jerwood and it might say permission to enter the harbour via the swashway to go to Petrol Pier and QHM would approve it, hopefully. So the person that's approving it is in, in this chair. Hold on, <coughs> excuse me. And there's, these guys do about an hour each in the chair because it's quite intensive. I can imagine on a summer's day, lots going on. They've got to be really aware of what they're doing, situational awareness, listening to the radio, perhaps looking at all these screens as well, because um, these screens have got AIS on and radar on, and you see all the vessels coming in and they need to make decisions on whether they should let this one in, whether they should let that one in, whether they should hold a vessel. Um, and all that is recorded. And then as you can see up here, we've got some cameras. So there's a camera there always on the harbour entrance because that's technically our sort of most risky area. And then as it happens, that one's looking at the international port. Um, why do we record it all? Well, if we have an instance. So uh, what I looked at today was we had a report from a P2000 that he'd had somebody come out of the harbour, shoot in front of him, do a couple of donuts around him and then sped off. Um, I'm glad to say it wasn't quite as uh, bad as that, but it was bad enough that um, the operator of the vessel that was driving like he stole it will be getting a little email from me with um, uh, findings from having having looked at the system. And we also have that so that we can record it and share it with other parties if needs be. So if there's a really big incident, um, then we can uh, download it off the system and share it with the MCA or somebody else that might be investigating it. But these guys are on watch uh, 24 hours a day. There's, I think, I think there's 18 of them in that team to make it work. Um, they listen on Channel 11. And if you're really bored at home and you're reasonably close, you can probably hear Channel 11 to about 50 miles away. Um, and you can hear what's going on in Portsmouth, which is what certainly what I did in the uh, in lockdown. Um, listen to it when you're in the harbour, but not necessarily just us. So if you were in Aberdeen or if you were in Liverpool or if you were in the Clyde or in the Thames, um, or any other port area and you're out and about, you'll probably find the captains actually listening to what's going on. So careers wise, um, a lot of these guys are ex-Navy. Um, some of them aren't. Some of them decided they want to be involved in vessel traffic management and they've been to the uh, been to school and done the courses they need to do to keep, keep us all safe. Uh, and they enjoy their work. They have a very nice rotation from what I can make out. But at the end of a 12 hour shift, they're ready to go home, especially when it's really busy in the summer. So I'm touched that I had a colleague that looks after the, the port conservancy and the, the hydrography. So this vessel here is HMS Magpie. Um, you might have heard about her, but she's sort of one of the newer vessels, very small compared to some of the others. She's about 18 meters long and she's equipped with all the latest um, surveying equipment. She comes down once in a while and does some surveys for us. Um, but we have a we have the harbour surveyed three times a year so that we can keep an eye on what's happening with it silting up. Because as with any harbour, there's water coming in and water going out and water coming off the land. So it does silt up. So that where the aircraft carriers live, it's dug out a bit deeper so they don't effectively sit on the bottom at low tide, which isn't an ideal thing to do for, for a large vessel. Um, and then the other thing that uh, my colleague does, Dave, is he goes out every month in one of the pilot vessels with a GPS antenna, you see here, 
on the side and they go around the entire neighborhood all of our 55 square miles and they check that the boys are in position again this comes back to making sure it's all right and it's all legal um and he stopped they stop the boat right next to the boy and they press the button and then it gives it a latitude and longitude and then plugs it back in when he comes in and it tells you whether or not it's out of range if it's out of range then we have to issue what's known as a navigation warning and we'll say for argument's sake east bramble is 200 meters northeast of where it should be or, or something to that effect dave also uh, coordinates everything with the hydrographic office so with these people that make charts he's an ex-hydrographer in the navy um did quite a lot of time there um, and now came to work for us in the civil service. Um, he's got an interesting job. It's a uh, lot, lots going on. It never sits still. And this time of year we have a dredge. So they're doing surveying as we speak, and then they'll compare it with what it should be to what needs to be scraped off the bottom, so to speak. And then at some point next week, they'll start dredging. So those dredgers will come in, scratch off all the bottom and then take it out out of the port um, into the uh, outer approaches to the Solent uh, where it'll get dumped but the pilots those Admiralty pilots they'll be really busy next week because those uh, dredgers will probably be working 24 hours a day so they'll be getting on and getting off bringing their bringing them in and out. Um, Harbour patrols um, we're very lucky in Portsmouth we have uh, these guys you might have seen them They're not particular pictures but they are the volunteer Harbour Patrol so they are a very dedicated team of volunteers that work every weekend from Easter till October and they have two boats, they have the big boat and the little boat and they sit in the harbour entrance and uh, provide maritime safety information if needed. Um, they've towed people in, they've pulled people off dinghies, they've pulled people in from swimming um, and basically are sort of good neighbours and uh, help us out with traffic management in the summer because when the tide's going out of the harbour entrance at sort of three and a half knots and there's a little boat trying to come in against the tide you often get swept about so these guys can be a bit like an, a bit like the the um the, the the yellow sign on the motorway pushing the light over pushing the with the flash going keep over keep over and then underneath here is um what is known as qhm patrol so that's the queen's harbour master's vessel i spend quite a lot of time that in the summer the difference between me and thee, so to speak, is that I actually hold the powers of delegation of the Queen's Harbour Master himself. So I can I reserve the right to stop somebody and educate them and uh, tell them off if needs be and take their details. Whereas these guys don't. These guys do about 10 knots at a push. I can do 30 knots and we've both got blue flashing lights, which is quite useful. But the good thing about that 30 knots is it enables us to cover that ground of the of the solent relatively quickly and so if on a summer's day we hear there's a load of trouble somewhere in an anchorage or on a beach we can we can go over there with the blue flashing light and with our body warm video and say come on guys pack it in or what do you think you're doing or sorry to hear there's been a disaster so a little bit dynamic what else we got here um got a website got loads of stuff on the website um we've got all the tides for for a month out and then we've got all the sunrise and the sunset we've got the shipping movements we've got the diving loads of sort of information about the port we've got a twitter feed and we've got uh, a picture here with all the warnings on so uh, we touched on uh, navigation warnings if a boy is out of position or a light doesn't work and we've also got general directions which might be things like speed limits or reporting of incidents or um reporting in uh for vessels in certain places um which is if the people go against that repeatedly we can look to prosecute so if people are speeding repeatedly we can uh, take them to court and find them and we took uh, a couple of jet skiers to court a couple of years ago and then uh, another one that's quite close to people's heart at the moment is dumping rubbish and we're finding people that have bought boats as of a bit of a project have decided it's not actually for them and uh, dump them in the harbour which is absolutely shameful but it's uh, sadly what we have to do and then we've also got local notice to mariner so what's a notice to mariner that's another bit of legislation about um in this week we've put out about uh dredging we've put out about uh solent swim guidelines we've put out 
we've put out about the uh, autonomous. We're seeing a lot of autonomous activity. We'd like to know all about that. So if you were coming into Portsmouth or you were taking a boat out of Portsmouth or a vessel out of Portsmouth, part of your planning and your passage planning would be to check QHM and see what shipping movements are going to be on, see what the tide's doing, seeing what the safety information is, and then anything else that might be relevant. And that's about it. So there's a picture there of HMS Victory, which I think uh, you might be familiar with. It's a few years ago now. because She hasn't had her mast in for a while. And uh, that's a very happy member of my four-deck team a few years ago in the North Sea. So uh, I'm going to stop sharing and put my camera back on. How does that sound? To you, team. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Becky. Um, right. So. I noticed we're now at the end, so we've got some Q&A. There is only one question, so please feel free, guys, to throw in uh, any questions. I say that, I'm, I'm sure looking at Becky's face, you'll see. Yeah. <laughs> so we've, we've got one here. Um, what are the tugs doing when firing water into the air? So that's, uh, <laughs> that's a good one. Uh, it's a, they do it to practice and it's for um, handling fire. So if we've got a vessel on fire, they can spray it over the top of them. And the picture was uh, a celebration. So a bit like um, a ship might be paid off or a member of staff might be leaving. They sort of put a bit of, it's a bit like a peacock when the peacock puts its tail out. And it's a little bit of tail wagging to say, thank you very much. Well done. Bravo Zulus. And um, we'll, we'll wave you off with a, with a spray with the fire monitor. Does that help? Sounds good. Oh, and we've got uh, another one. Um, to work in the harbour control team, do you have to have worked on boats? No, not at all. You can... Um, vessel... Vessel Traffic Management System, VTMS. Um, you don't have to have done it. Obviously, if you've got a background in maritime, it makes life a bit easier because you're not learning a whole load of new speak, which, of course, your unit has got you all over anyway because of the fact that you're involved with sort of sea-based world, so to speak. But you don't have to. Um, there's all sorts of training courses about that. But um, I think one of our, I think all our team have been to sea as it happens, but it's it's not essential. That sounds good. Uh, oh, oh, coming in thick and fast now. <laughs> so, along similar kind of lines, but a more sort of general look at this one. Uh, what qualifications and experience do you need to start a career with QHM? Ooh, that's a good one, isn't it? <laughs> Whoever's asking that. <laughs> Million dollar question. You need to be some form of mariner. Um, I have a yacht master ticket and uh, I've spent all that time in sail training. So um, I don't have the same qualifications as Tony with a tug captain, uh, not tug captain, there's QEC pilot who'd been a tug captain. But um, that's one example. Dave's been a hydrographer. So he's he's been at sea working in the Navy as a hydrographer. Um, the VTMS guys we sort of touched on before in harbour control. Um, Deputy Queen's Harbour Master, he's been at other ports, he's been a Harbour Master at other ports and he's run a traffic, man traffic management system, he's a master mar in his own right, driving oil tankers. Um, the port safety officer was with Border Force for a while as an officer of the watch. Um, the pilots are, are mostly a minimum of a Master 3000, some of them are ex-Navy, um, some of them are um, unlimited. So it's a bit of everything, really. A solid background in maritime is um, important to work for, for QHM. Smashing. And oh, here's a good question for you. What is the best bit about your job? <laughs> <laughs> Who's asked that? <laughs> oh, man, on a summer's day, when you're cruising around the Solent and people are waving at you and you see something, you think, I need to go and talk to them. And just engaging with people is lovely. I mean, a day like today, I don't know who I'm talking to, which makes it obviously quite difficult. But when you're out on the water and you're driving around with Queen's Harbour Master on the side, that's quite cool, really, especially when you're going really fast and the blue light's flashing. <laughs> I've worked hard to get here, by the way. <laughs> 
Fantastic. Another sort of careers oriented question. Um, are there apprenticeships available for QHM? Not for us because uh, we are civil service um, and to be part of our team, as I alluded to, you have to have the experience which you wouldn't get in the civil service, but you would get in the Navy. Uh, however, Serco, who are the guys that run the tugs, the passenger carriers, the pilot vessels, the sullage barges, they have an apprenticeship scheme. And um, it's, it's one of the better ones, I understand. And they take a whole load of people on every year. If you think every single one of those tugs has at least two crews, and then there's often a, a third crew that they rotate with as well. Um, and that's a lot of people to keep all that activity available 24 hours a day. Good stuff. Um, oh, we've got the other end of the scale now with a career. Um, was there a point in your career that made you want to give it up? Oh, uh, you? <laughs> they're all coming out the way now, aren't they? Would I want to? You see, that's a double edged question, really, because I wouldn't want to give up working in maritime. There's absolutely no doubt about that. I love working in maritime, I love working with port operations. Love being outside. I love the fact the freedom it gives you. As any sort of any boater will tell you, we're very lucky in this country that we can basically go to sea without a whole pile of um, certification for pleasure. For commercial, it's a little bit different. However, I've done a lot of sail training in some pretty um, what should we say difficult conditions, and I think all good things have to come to an end. And there's an element of um, wanting a certain amount of your life back um, that made me thought, actually, I don't need to have compression or concussion in the middle of the Atlantic. So after I'd had a fairly serious conversation with two of my crew, um, having had a, a, a kicking in the middle of the Atlantic a few years ago, it was decided that I didn't really need to go offshore anymore. But I still get my boating fixed because I can go and do stuff with Royalist and I enjoy sailing on Royalist and seeing all you guys and uh, the team that are involved with running, that's great. Um, and then also the whole sort of thing that the Navy brings to you and Sea Cadet brings to you, because it's just one big family, really. Would I walk away from it? I think unlikely, but my, my background is actually, I'm a farmer's daughter from Somerset. So you couldn't really get, <laughs> <laughs> more extreme but when you think about it it's still outside it's still it's still active it's still dynamic but um i'm actually really badly allergic to the farm which is why i went to sea <laughs> uh, uh, <clears throat> excuse me <coughs> um right another question in now well, it's an, an allegiance question this one what's your favorite type of warship that you've ever worked with oh Oh man! Oh no! It's not going to upset somebody on the call. I think the batch two OPVs, so HMS Tamar, HMS Tyne, HMS Force. There's another one. Is there another one? I think they're a really good looking. They're a good looking boat, and I think they're small enough that you they're personable enough, so everybody knows each other. Whereas the the QE, don't get me wrong, is pretty impressive when you see. Uh, leaving with all that gear on it but I think the smaller vessels are a bit more personable and you get to know people a bit better with it. Oh, so, sounds good. Um, we've got no open questions at the minute guys. We've still oh, got no, no 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 look there's, look, there's one coming up. Oh, here we go. Have you ever heard about the Clipper sail race and do you ever want to do it? Oh, wow. Wow. I used to work for Clipper. <laughs> I worked for Clipper from 98 to uh, 2005. I, I drove the big boats for them quite a lot. I drove the Clipper 60s and the uh, uh, Clipper 68s, which are the, the previous versions to what's live now. And we at the time, we also had a fleet of 38 footers. So I ran that as well. I think the Clipper race is amazing. It's come on leaps and bounds in the last 20 years. And uh, I have to give full credit to Robin because he was the one that sort of took me on as a bit of an unknown and uh, probably learned all my big boat stuff through working for Clipper, which then got me the job at Joint Services, which then got me the job at QHM. Um, would I like to do it? I think 20 years ago, I'd like to have done it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, <laughs> I think if you do want to do it, give it your all. It is tough. Um, 
there's a lot to it. Um, there's a lot of media pressure on you. There's a lot of pressure on the crews and the boats are very basic. There's no heating. There's no windlasses. There's no roller furlers. There's no water pilots and they are full of condensation. So um, I think I like my creature comfort. So I'm just going to go put another log on the fire. Yeah. <laughs> Good stuff. Um, I don't want to say it again because they'll probably fly, <laughs> fly in, but there's no open questions at the minute, guys. We do have another sort of five minutes. Um, so if, if you can think of any questions, please do fire in. I'm just going to, I'm just going to see if I can find a couple of pictures, which those of you that are thinking about joining the Navy, we haven't talked about the Royal Fleet Auxiliary, um, which is sort of like the Navy supply chain. So I alluded to the fact that the OPVs um, have a very large range under engine, but the type 23s, the type 45s don't. So you will always find a refueler. Let me see if I can find this uh, slide because it's it's quite it's it's quite a good slide, um, and it it shows how much is actually going for the navy at the moment and the Royal Fleet Auxiliary. And I think if I had my time again, I'd have probably joined the Royal Fleet Auxiliary. Right here we go. Here it is. Let me share my screen. Oops. To, oh, there's another. There's another question coming. Yeah, it's just come in there. Yeah, uh, let, me, let me just share this. Let me share that, and then we go that. You seen that picture before? Some of you might have seen it. So in the foreground, you've got a Type 23. I don't know which one it is, but it's Type 23 there. In the background, you've got uh, HMS Queen Elizabeth with a jet taking off with uh, two helicopters on a stern there, and then in the middle, you've got one of the uh, Tide class tankers. So this one's full of fuel you can take a chinook helicopter on the back and then also you've obviously got the guy in the picture taking the in a sorry the guy in the helicopter taking the picture so there's a huge amount going on with that this this uh, refueler can fill a aircraft carrier at the same time that it's filling a type 23 and they can put stores across they can send ammunition across etc etc a lot of those boats work out of portland or sometimes out of Plymouth, but we see them coming through us as well. So they uh, they coming out. There's a that's a whole new whole new kettle of fish, which I will be out of my depth talking much more about. <laughs> oh, it's a couple more questions. So I've I've got one here. They're asking, would it be okay to try and play the video again? So I think that yeah, was the I'll see if I can. One. I'm trying to find it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to find it. That's why I'm putting it in. See if I can find it in another presentation because it would appear my. Uh, Copying. Is this it here? Is this going to work? Let's go. Let's do that. Right, here we go. Let's, let's go. Right, we'll do it from this one here. Right, let's uh, share this screen. Share screen. Share screen. Share. Share. Right, how about that? Can you see that? Type 45? So that's Dragon in the basin there. In, in the, not in the basin, in the lock. Here she goes, coming out of the lock. So if I run it again, here she is coming out of the lock. You see there's a tug here on the bow, another tug there that's stationary. Type 45 there, OPV there, P2000 there, fuel barge there, tug's moved. That's the pilot going backwards and forwards. Police launch going in, another sullage barge there. Police launch going out, some spare fenders. That's the big tug, that's the Tempest going out. There's an OPV over here. Just he's got a bit of wind on his bow there, so that's just that's probably about 10 15 minutes work compressed into what's that about 10 15 seconds? So, um, hopefully, that's a little bit of uh, something interesting. 
Any more questions? Really good. Any more Q and A, guys? Before we start wrapping it up. Nothing open at the minute. Okay. Uh, if there's no more questions, then I'd just like to uh, thank you for coming on tonight, Becky. That was really, really. Cool. <laughs> um, oh, oh, oh. I thank you. <laughs> That's always good. Yeah. yeah so I thank you uh, again for coming on. Really interesting. Um, and I know certainly from my my perspective, I actually, <laughs> I actually found out really interesting. I'm, I'm in the industry myself, so it's quite good. Uh, yeah, there's a, that's, there is a longer presentation, but it's uh, also I didn't want to drone on for too long and make it relevant <laughs> for, to you guys rather than another's audience. <laughs> and there's some really good feedback coming in as well, which is good. So yeah, thanks again, and thanks for uh, everybody joining in. Thanks to Ruth for coming on as our second adult, and uh, yeah. Hopefully, going forward, guys, keep an eye out for careers webinars. Um, because let's let's be honest, looking at a pamphlet is not as good as coming onto these and actually speaking <laughs> to somebody, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, and, and getting the proper, you know, the, the, the proper first hand experience, guys. So do do log on and any uh, questions, send them over and we'll try and answer them. Go on our website or contact us on Twitter, and we're more than happy to answer anything that you might have forgotten right now. Right, no more questions coming through. So again, thanks for your time. Thanks for this time. And I'll maybe bump into you at some point in the future. Maybe. Look after <laughs> yourselves, guys, and uh, see you soon. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.